Good evening and welcome to the black hole. Today we have a German scholar and it's very unusual for us to have somebody of this caliber just uh, pass through the city. But Sarah Holtz, who did her doctoral dissertation on the subject, Governance of Islam in Pakistan. She lived here between 2013 and 2017. And then she also taught at Qaid Azam University until I believe 2020 or so. The book is before you. I've browsed through it. I just received it a day earlier, so it's very, very thick, very, very dense. It's chock full of facts. And it's a remarkable example of German scholarship, the thoroughness with which a subject has been penetrated, analyzed, and discussed. So we're very happy to have you here, Sarah. We're also happy to have you, sir, Haris Khaliq. Um, Haris is a poet, writer, critic, and uh, a familiar face at the black hole. <laughs> I'm going to structure this by asking Sarah to tell us a bit about her book, maybe 15, 20 minutes, in which you tell us the main points. And then we go into a critical discussion of some of the main issues that you've raised. Some will be raised by Harris, some will be raised by me. And then uh, after roughly one hour or so, then this will be open to all of you to ask whatever you would like. And uh, at the black hole, we're used to having open and frank discussions. So this being um, considered a somewhat sensitive subject in the Islamic Republic of Pakistan, <coughs> may um, hinder, in a normal audience, certain kinds of questions, but we uh, are not bound to such strictures. So, Sarah, why don't you begin, tell us a bit about um, your book, but before that, why you wrote the book and why you chose to dwell upon this topic. Um, thank you very much for having me here um, at the Black Hole. Um, and thank, thank you also very much for um, the EU for bringing me here and also arranging this talk. So thank you very much. Thank you all of you for being here. Um, it's it's a great honor. And um, I'm also always a bit nervous about the reception, of course, in Pakistan of the book because it is uh, about Pakistan and I don't want to do any injustice as well, of course. Um, why did I write the book? Um, I was working in Pakistan um, between 2010 and 2012, um, uh, and I kept on reading about this Council of Islamic Ideology, and I heard uh, people talk about um, that, that there are these religious scholars who make um, uh, judgments and so on and so on. Um, and I just got kind of interested in what is this institution and what does it do? And um, everyone I asked gave me a different answer. Um, and I think more than half of the people said, oh, it doesn't matter. It's a religious institution. Um, it really doesn't matter. It's a rubber stamp. Um, and for me, then, the th my thinking was, well, it's been there for a very long time, um, so there has to be a purpose to it, and there has to be an impact. Um, and so I started searching for literature, and I couldn't really find anything, uh, or only one book by Jamal Malik, uh, which is already from the 1980s. Um, and that's kind of the start of my PhD project. Um, and so my um, aim and purpose then was to yeah really think about from a so I'm a political scientist from a political science perspective how does this institution work and my major question in a sense here was also what is a religious institution of the state so what distinguishes a religious or Islamic institution from other institutions of the state so what makes it special in that sense um, so that's kind of where I started um, shall, I, shall I immediately go on? Yeah, yeah okay. Um, so for me, something that I saw was, and, and I mean, you all are very familiar with it, that it, there's this really kind of polarized debate um, that is out there about religion and so on. And something that I found was that um, 
whenever you label something religious or Islamic, it becomes very difficult to talk about it because you immediately put like boundaries around things. So um, for, for me, um, what this label basically meant that was that no one actually ever looked at the institution properly. Also, a lot of political scientists don't. You see the same thing with religious political parties. There are very few political scientists who look at them um, in, an, uh, in, an, in a systematic fa fashion. So here, m one question was then also for me, how do we study these institutions? First of all, again, what, how are they different or are they different from other state institutions? And then how do we study them? Do we need to adjust existing frameworks of analyses? Um, and so for me, I see this label religious or Islamic always as a marker of exception, which very often means that you cannot talk about it. Um, and so what I did is, um, I, that's why I used not Islamization, but I used governance of Islam, because for me the idea was that governance also means a lot of different processes. It's a back and forth, it's not a unidirectional thing. Um, and because what, what became clear to me over time is that the council is not a static institution. It keeps on changing, while for a lot of people in their head, um, it is a static institution. They say, oh, there are these mullahs, the ulama, and so on and so on. Um, and it always looks like it's static and set in time. But when you actually look at it, so the perception and the reality are quite different. And um, that's kind of where I started. A second observation that I'm made was that um, if there are academic studies, or even when people talk about it in the press, they only talk about one institution, the council, or the Okaf department, or the Riyadh -e Hilal committee, and so on and so on. But what became clearer and clearer to me is that they form a network. It's not just one institution, but you have to look at them in relation to each other. And that's one of my main arguments in the book is then also that it's not just one institution, but they draw kind of um, power and authority in terms, of, in terms of norms from their interactions with each other. So what has happened over decades is that they created frames of reference um, and some form of intertextuality. This means they always keep on referring to each other and to each other's decisions. Um, and, and that becomes very, very important then as well in any discussion because, for instance, the council, on nearly every subject that you can think about, they've already at some point in the existence, so the council came into official existence in 1962. There were other institutions before that, but the official found, uh, establishment was then um, uh, that they basically have made some kind or issued some kind of opinion at some point in the last like um, 50 years already. So whenever there's a new discussion, even today, um, immediately you can point to a decision that the council has already taken in some form of the other. Um, then um, th that, that was an, is another main uh, argument, so to speak. Mm. A second thing that I observed while looking at the members of the council, so here again the idea is that it's the council is the institution, but the members make the institution, and the members change constantly. Um, and so what I did in one of the chapters is I actually I traced all members from 1962 until 2017, I traced all of them and I looked at their professional biographies, and I categorized them. Um, and so you see patterns that emerge, and they kind of reflect also what happens in the government. Um, so for instance, you see um, what happens in 1971. Up until 1971, the official language in the council is English, um, because you have half of the members are actually from East Pakistan. And then you have this watershed moment, so to speak, in 1971, when there's the East Pakistan-West Pakistan war, um, and then East Pakistan becomes Bangladesh, suddenly half of the elite is kind of gone. And so most of the members were either from Lahore, Karachi, or they were from Dhaka. Um, and so after 1971, what you see is that suddenly there are members from smaller towns, um, also from like Southern Punjab and Hyderabad and so on. Um, and so, he, but what you can then also see is that even though now there are more members, so there is more diversity in some way because there are people from more cities, but 
on the other hand, they're still from the elite, local elites. So they're still the peer of this um, shrine in a smaller town and so on and so on. So um, one argument for me in that sense is that even though the members might change, but they're always from certain local elites and they reflect certain political settlements that exist in Pakistan anyways. So actually no matter so much, and uh, no matter how the, how the council is made up, certain um, decisions don't change that much because most of the elites, no matter where they politically maybe stand, they c can agree on certain issues and they remain kind of the same. The language might change, but the issues itself and the settlement kind of remains the same. So for me then, the conclusion from that would be that the council is firmly in embedded in existing patterns of governance and rule in Pakistan, which are marked by patriarchy, by ethnicity, um, by feudalism, by sectarianism, and so on. So the council, in that sense, is not exceptional. So when we say it's Islamic or religious, it's exceptional. For me, it's not exceptional. It, it's actually an expression of what already exists in Pakistan in general, these patterns of rule and power. Um, and that is also then reflected in the decisions they take in the members that who are appointed. Um, and it also is, for instance, reflected in the fact that um, we cannot only look at the council itself, but also, for instance, the members are appointed by the president of Pakistan. Um, but it's not really clear how they are appointed. So here you have like this um, unpredictability and intransparency that very often exists in other parts of governance. You see the same thing here. So for me, um, the conclusion I draw, drew from this is that it is a local institution, so it's a very uniquely Pakistani institution, but at the same time, it's not necessarily a traditional institution of in as in it's something that has been ex that has existed forever. But it's a very modern institution because it responds to the modern needs of the modern state of Pakistan. So I think I leave it at that. I think that was already enough. Okay, that's very provocative that it's a modern institution. Modernity, as you know, as a social scientist, has a very different meaning, one that derives from the Enlightenment. And there's nothing enlightened that uh, one sees, one does not see the elements of Enlightenment as expressed in the European way. In fact, as you said, it's feudal, patriarchal values that are reflected those from centuries earlier. Let me pose a couple of questions to you and then um, Harris has his own questions, I'm sure. One is about the extent to which the Islamic Ideology Council reflects the, the needs of people in this country. Take, for example, land reform. Now, land reform, according to the Islamic Ideology Council, is against Islam. There was a ruling with uh, Maulana Taqi Usmani, I believe, who was heading the council at that time, which said that land ownership is permanent, according to Islam, and efforts made by earlier Ayub Khan, then Bhutto, were therefore against the spirit of Islam. And to this day, that has not been reversed. Whereas if you go out into the street and you ask an ordinary person and say, what's Islam about? And they'll say it's about social justice. It's about economic justice. And land reform would be very much a part of that. So how do you think, what do you think about this? Does the Governance then reflect popular opinion or not? That would be one question. Then, then, then I'll ask Harris to uh, ask his question. I'll come back to you. Yeah. Um, no, that's, uh, thank you for this question. I think it's great because it basically illustrates uh, the argument that the council is embedded in governance, existing governance structures that uphold these political settlements. Um, because it's staffed by the elite, so it's not in their interest to have land reforms and so on, and they package it 
the so so it's like this intersection between feudalism, religion, patriarchy, sectarianism, ethnicity that comes into being through the council. Another thing that's quite interesting is that as as far as I know from the people I talk to who are in the council or who used to be council members is that the council these me these council members saw themselves and the council not as an institution of and for the people. Um, so one thing is that ordinary citizens cannot approach the council with concerns. The council can take suomoto action in the sense of, the, so one of their functions of the council is guidance. Um, so if they see ob and observe something in, in the newspapers, for instance, or if they hear something, they can take it up, but only if the chairman deems it necessary. So here again you see authoritarian ruling structures in a way, it's not democratic in that way. Um, and it, it sees itself in that sense as for the legislative and the executive and guiding them and not like the like the common people or citizens in that sense. While the federal Sharia court, and this is also where those two institutions differ, sees itself more cl or like closer to the people because um, citizens can uh, uh, bring Sharia petitions before the court, and the court has to react to those appeals on the, the Sharia petitions, um, and they they cannot dismiss them. While the council is kind of sees itself as autonomous and flowing, kind of somewhere further up, and you can also. Um, uh, see this in uh, reflected in the, the um, recommendations they issue. So also in the first like ten years, um, they were only concerned with like um, uh, a graveyard for national heroes and stamps for national heroes, and so so they were very much interested at the federal level and about the narrative, but they were not that interested in everyday problems as such, or they are only like sub points in the reports at the very end. Um, another thing, of course, is also that, um, so the function, one of the other functions of the council is that actually laws have to be referred to the council by the president, the governor of a province, or the two-fifth, I think two-fifths majority of either the um, national or the provincial assembly or the senate. Um, and so uh, here it's also, that has hardly ever happened. Um, and instead, the council usually takes Suomoto action and they examine the laws on their own account. But what does happen is that ministries, and that's an informal um, procedure that has hap um, uh, um, developed over time, that um, lots of ministries ask the council questions and they are actually very minute questions. And so here the interesting thing, and that was one of my discoveries in a way, f or uh, like surprising things for me was that most people talk about the council as being pre-legislation, like looking at and examining laws, but what I have seen with these ministries when they refer um, questions to the council queries, they actually receive answers and they these answers actually feed into lawmaking, so it's pre-lawmaking, it's before the laws are formulated. So in that sense, even though the recommendations of the council might not be that concerned with the citizens, but because they give advice before the laws are made and the laws are for the people, in that sense it flows into those laws, their advice. Mm. The issue of graveyards is not something that, um, well, it's important in a way, but it's not something that's fundamental. What was fundamental was, for example, land reform, which never happened in Pakistan, mm -hmm. did happen in India. And it's related to the structure of the governing party, the Muslim League. Now, I'm not quite sure when the Islamic Ideology Council was set up. I only became aware of it at the time of General Ziaul Haq because of the kind of uh, decisions that were being taken at that time. But this bringing Islam into governance came at a very early stage in Pakistan. I'm sure you will agree because it was seen that uh, the landlords who formed the majority of the Muslim League would have as their natural supporters the peers and the mullahs. Not so much the mullahs, but the peers, 
particularly because Jinnah relied very heavily upon them for getting votes for the Muslim League and he succeeded. They failed miserably in 1937 but won spectacularly in 1946 and that was because of the help of the peers. So the Muslim League never had a program ever for land reform and therefore we see the resistance to that and therefore we see that occasional individuals like Masood Khadar Posh rise up and say that this needs to be changed. So I absolutely agree with you that the, the uh, governance, the, the, the people who constitute the, the Islamic ideology council are very embedded in the power structure of the country. That appears to be one of the major conclusions of your book. Harris, what do you say about this? No, thank you very much. Thank you, Black Hole, and thank you, Sarah, for coming out with this book work. And, but I, since I'm not an academic per se, um, I'll have a political sort of an interpretation and, or, you know, um, sort of questions or issues, concerns, my concerns are more of a political and social nature. And I can completely understand when you are as an academic researching a subject, then, um, you know, you have to be compassionate with your subject, which you have been. Um, I think, um, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll go back and, um, and just remind us all, because you all know that, it's a very um, informed audience, um, that when you have a communal partition and creating a country on the basis of a religious identity, if not religion itself, I mean, that is debated whether uh, a Muslim identity was the basis for creating this country or whether in, uh, imposition of Islam or Sharia law was the basis for this country. I, in either case, um, I read this Canadian scholar who, was, who used to teach at FC College in, in the 1940s and 50s, uh, Wilfred Canfield Smith, and he had argued then, back in the 1950s, that you can have a theocracy established by the will of people if you create a country in the name of faith. So there is there's something you know, interesting that we need to remind ourselves. And then as far as the Council of Islamic Ideology is concerned, you're absolutely right. This was created by General Ayub Khan, who, was, who considered himself self-proclaimed champion of secular Pakistan. He created the Council of Islamic Ideology. And in 1962, he had um, uh, promulgated this new constitution under martial rule. And it became a part of the, of the setup. And it is very unfortunate that in 1973, uh, uh, Mr. Bhutto, who was quasi-secular, uh, or at least seen by, by some of his supporters as secular, actually continued with the council. Now, as far as I can understand, the Pakistani, the council itself, actually, I mean, it is an institution, and it is a modern institution if you look at it from the governance lens, from the corporate lens, but it is there, it is a part of the conservative spread, the horizontal spread of conservative power centers in Pakistan. It is one of those power centers which actually contributes to this horizontal spread of, uh, of uh, conservatism in the country. And I think it is a redundant institution for two reasons. One is the, um, and you can respond to that of course, um, one is the reason, and it actually gets, um, you know, what I'm saying is, I mean, I, I read that part of the, the, the chapter where you have you have actually concluded, as it were, that you know it is the it represents the power elites of Pakistan. It is a redundant institution, even if you go by the constitution uh, of this country. Article two twenty seven of the Constitution of Islamic Republic of Pakistan says that no law can be made by any legislature which is repugnant to Islam. So, so the parliamentarians in any way are bound by the fundamental sort of the basic tenets of, of, of the majority faith, that they cannot legislate against the, uh, the basic tenets of, of faith. Um, now you can, you can have it interpreted by, you know, by different means, and you can say that you would need a council to interpret what is Islamic and what is un-Islamic, but that's, again, very problematic, because when I elect my uh, member parliament, I would expect my member parliament to represent me, rather than... Uh, sending away my concerns to a cleric who's, who does not represent me, any cleric or any body of clerics. 
then if you look at the composition and uh, and also federal shariat court is there so like when something happens in pakistan you have two streams of laws i'm not a lawyer so correct me if i'm wrong if there's a lawyer sitting in the audience um pakistan has common law the british law that we have inherited as well as the uh, the sharia law uh, and now the sharia law is very interestingly subservient to common law because the federal shariat court is subservient to the supreme court this is again uh, another very interesting contradiction that we have however if there is a law which is made by any of the legislature uh and you know somebody wants to challenge it on the basis of the majority faith there is the federal shariat court so why would you need a council of islamic ideology uh, where uh, you know you have a federal shariat court you have a, a, a you know a parliament which is bound by article 227 not to legislate against islam the third thing is the composition and membership and i actually had an opportunity to sort of quickly read browse through skim through the chapter because i also got the the preprint uh, uh, sort of uh, version uh, just night before last but the that is an important chapter you know you, you see the membership if you look at the membership and um i'm not sure if you want to deal with it even more uh, perhaps in later works uh that 20% of the pakistani muslim population is from different shia dominations from the twelvers to the smileys to boras and to other dominations i mean that's that's kind of ballpark about 20% of the pakistani muslim population you will not find in the 61 years of the council's history that anybody who's you know who's either not a deobandi cleric or somebody influenced by jamaat e islami has become the chairman of the council even the uh, maulana qasir niazi who was uh, uh, who became the chair in the 1990s also before pakistan people's party he was affiliated with jamaat e islami so now jamaat e islami and deobandis there are lots of differences i mean i totally understand how maulana maududi interpreted it and how uh, deobandis interpret it but you will not find an alaydis either you will not find uh, anybody from a shia denomination and you will not find anybody from the majority barelvi subsect of sunnis so this is something really interesting that from within the muslim population about 70 75% of the population i mean the peers and the shrine uh, custodians of shrines have become certainly become members but they have never been or Uh, if there is an exception to prove the rule uh, you know i'll stand corrected but there is there's never been anybody except for the deobandis and the jamaat islami influenced people and all the juis is actually uh, a deobandi jamaat um, so so it is something really interesting that the council has very little to do with the aspirations even of people who would want a council representing them even those who uh, unlike me would want a council of islamic ideology representing all uh, different denominations and sects it is not representative of that and finally i mean i have said um, uh, a lot of things i i think that um you see going back um, there there has to be a a sort of a, a completely and you know i ideally speaking uh, the state if the state will have a faith the state will also have a sect and that is what we have seen uh through the 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 functions of of the council of islamic ideology there has been uh just a, a caveat i mean there has been some amazing people uh, who have been a part of the council they have made some very interesting uh, and modern sort of uh, progressive um, judgments but there are very few few and far between so Thank Aris, you. what you're saying is that there is bias in the membership and certainly um the facts that you've that you've uh, presented point towards that but really there is no guidance as to who the members should be no guidance from the quran or from the hadith that's because the notion of an islamic state did not exist at the time of the prophet the prophet well the quran does not contain the word state at all and the holy prophet never specified a successor and he didn't there was no such concept as a mufti or a sheikh 
or Malvi or any other in Islam. And so, and so therefore, the membership reflects that confusion. And Sarah, as you point out in your book, the confusion is then in the decisions that are taken. So for example, there was, um, you, you can talk more about that. There was the issue of what should be prayer timings here in Islamabad or in any city. And um, yeah, there was, some people agreed that it should be at this time. Some people agreed it should be at that time. And then nobody obeyed those decisions. And now a, what we have is that in every mohalla, there's a different time for your masjid to have azans five times a day. So how important is the lack of doctrine in terms of guiding the functions of the Islamic Ideology Council. After all, it is not there in any Islamic holy book. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Can I just quickly add one Absolutely. thing? Um, because with the membership, um, is is really, really interesting. And I think so for me, one aim was also because I think it's very difficult to get rid of an institution once it's there. It, it, it develops its own life. So for me, m the question was more, how can you use it positively in a way? Um, and so on. And I think because, again, it's not static, there is possibility of change. So what you just also mentioned, how uh, the members representative of um, all citizens of Pakistan, because they're actually not only Muslim citizens, because the decisions of the council also affect non-Muslims. Um, and so uh, something, I mean, in the, co in the constitution, it says there should be diversity of uh, schools of thought um, as far as possible. And there should be one female member. Um, and then there should be two judges. So also here, it's not only ulama, it's really also technical experts who can become members. And so what we also see here, and, and that's where I get back to the patterns of governance and, and, and rule, is that it's always only been one female member, except for like one period where there were two for like two years or so. So here, I think it's something where one can push and say, why are there not more women? Because it's not one woman, it's not representative of all Muslim women of Pakistan. So why can we not, by now, there are so many very educated women why are there not more women on the council? So here, this is the the job of the president of Pakistan, right? To to appoint someone there. Um, and the same thing is uh, with like Shia Eliteshi. There, there's usually only one member. Why can't you have like, for instance, two and so on? So these, are, I think, also things where some changes are possible in that way. Um, and just also another brief uh, interjection. What's also really interesting, in 1973, um, the requirement for appointment was changed slightly. Um, so the requirement was beforehand that a person who has understanding of the principles of Islam, so it doesn't say you need to have a madrasa education, for instance, understanding of the principles of Islam and of Pakistan's economic, legal, and social and political problems, so an and. And in 1973, this was changed to or. And that basically enabled a lot of ulama to come in. Because beforehand, it wasn't possible to, base, uh, the only people were appointed who kind of had an idea of, if, if I get this really simple, simplistic, both worlds, so to speak. And what happens then after 73 uh, uh, or 74, when the council then was reconstituted, is that you have um, more of a specialization. And this is also reflective of the Bhutto government, because Bhutto also established the Ministry of Religious Affairs. It was him who did it. So he created this specific religious sphere and so here, the question would also be, what does religious knowledge mean? Does it have to be, a, is it a specific university that teaches it? Or what do you have to read? So here, I think that's another push factor is kind of to say, there can be people who, who are not, don't have madrasa degree, can still be scholars. And you see that also nowadays. And, and this is where the council, I think, the more it comes under scrutiny, um, the more it has to respond also to democratic ideas, so to speak, um, because what you can also see now, and that's where I come to modernity as well, um, what you, since the 
I would say the past 15 years, you have more and more members who are Uh, who, who have studied in madrasas, but who also earned PhDs in Islamic studies from universities, primarily um, uh, uh, Islamic University and um, Bahaudi and Sakaria University. So here you see also even those who are educated in religious subjects, they need to feel the need to acquire a modern degree, so to speak. And um, so here you can also see these changes, and I think that can also be a positive change in some way. Um, regarding the question with doctrine, um, I think there, um, there are so many different interpretations and I th one problem I think for inquiry is that we don't get the debates of the council, we only see the decisions. And, um, and, and so here we don't really know what the debates beforehand are and I think there the staff of the council is really important because they prepare um, the, the, the notes that the council members use for consultation and a lot of the staff, member, and the staff members are recruited by the council board which is constituted by the council chairman. And so this is why the council chairman is important because he, he can, it was always a man, so I'm only saying he, um, uh, he can determine who is recruited into the council as staff. And the staff are the backbone of the council. They're there permanently. They're hardly ever transferred. Yes. And they prepare the decisions. So it's actually, and that's something I didn't look at. Um, you have to also look at who are the staff members and what is their inclination. So it's sometimes because they already give a certain direction. And something that I saw when you, when you look at argumentation, again, only I can only see the decisions, not the debates, um, is that most of the time, the, uh, so for instance, in the 1960s, the discussion on riba, um, the council, everyone agreed riba is prohibited, but what, I what falls under riba, that is where the big discussion came about. So they could uh, have like a blanket statement, but then um, they, they could never really agree on the details. And this is also what happens in ministries when the council uh, sends uh, uh, its decisions or like its recommend, not decisions, recommendations. Um, what often the ministries do, if, if they don't agree, they find a little tiny detail and say, we don't understand this, or you didn't give us a unanimous decision on this, so, um, or you didn't consult this uh, person, and so on. And so they always bring it back. So it's a constant back and forth. And because we live in a social world, and so everything constantly changes. So I think that's why there's a fundamental clash also between Um, modern conceptions of law which are codified and also I think fiqh which is more fluid and uh, which then adapts to changes as well. So, and I think there's a fundamental clash between different epistemologies in that sense as well be, um, of the state which needs everything static and in policies and then on the other hand social and religious thought which actually adapts with time. Well, true, but we still haven't got to the fundamentals. The fundamental is that there is nothing, nothing in the Qur'an. There's not even a word for the state in Arabic. Not even a word. And there's nothing in the Hadith about an Islamic state. Which is why you see widely different systems of governance in different Muslim countries. There are 47 of them and all 47 are different. We call ourselves an Islamic state, the, and yet uh, the Saudi system and the Malaysian system and the Egyptian system bear no resemblance to what is in Pakistan. And so these are ab initio creations, and they're creations to support a power structure. But then come the contradictions with modernity. So since you took up the issue of riba, Well, now our finance minister, Isaac Dar, is saying that he's going to create an interest-free economy in this country. It's very interesting because <laughs> very shortly we, have no, we may have no economy at all. <laughs> How is he dreaming of something which belongs to the 7th century and which is an irreconcilable clash with modernity? Is he 
What's he smoking, is my question. Now, here is something that's, that's accepted in Saudi Arabia, the, heart, the heartland of Islam. It's there, all the banks are in Dubai. There is so-called Islamic banking there, but Islamic banking there, as well as here, is just giving a dressing up to the usual interest economy. I mean, I, I just go to the bank, I put money over there, a year later I get back 12% more or 9% more, whatever. They call it profit, <laughs> or you can call it anything that you like, it's interest basically. So th this is really the difficulty with which they are not grappling with, which is why they are irrelevant. So now my question to you is, you wrote this book, why is it relevant? Because nobody listens to them. Um, yeah, very, very good points. I mean, um, I think it is, so I, I will go back one step because basically actually I wanted to write about the council today initially, but because no one had worked on the earlier history, so I ended up actually mainly looking at the early history of the council. And um, a very important person, I think, for all of the structure was Muhammad Assad. Um, uh, and Mohammed Assad uh, was uh, born in Austria. He was born Jewish. Then he went to Palestine, uh, learned Arabic. Um, actually, in Berlin, he, he um, stepped over to Islam, um, which is very interesting, so very close to where my office is. Um, and then he was in Saudi Arabia, um, was a close associate of um, the future king of the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. And then he says this, I don't know, I can't confirm it, uh, Alama Iqbal invited him to Pakistan, or like to, to South Asia. Um, and he was then the head of the um, Department of Islamic Reconstruction, which, which was already founded in August 1947. And so he came here with his white privilege <laughs> as a European, not colonized subject, um, who also spoke fluent Arabic and thought he was better than everyone else because when you're born Muslim, it's not as much of an es effort. That, that's what he like, kind of implies in his writings. And so what he, and, 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 so, and I think it, he spoke to the elite and he could work well with the elite and that's why he was received well was because he pretend, or he said basically, um, we have to look at, at everything in a vacuum. It's, the customs are not so good, uh, sectarianism isn't good, ethnicity isn't good. Let's just, let's just work on an ideal state. And that's, I think, what a lot of the elite also in Pakistan, the same thing, that's what they thought. And, so, and what you also see very often nowadays is that people talk in ideal terms in a, vac in a vacuum and they pretend that there is no ground reality. And I think that's kind of the fundamental problem um, that you see up until today. Um, and at the, but then Muhammad Assad had to change. He changed his line of thinking. That's what he also says in his autobiography because he says, yeah, some, some people, because he saw himself as a traveler of the world, some people need roots. Some people need identity from um, certain other markers except for religion. So he kind of had to change his stance a little bit. Um, so, uh, and, and, and that's why I think the council is relevant because it has become in, in this world today, in this post 9-11 world and so on, there's so much polarization um, and we can't do away with that. Um, and so, and that's why I think it has become um, such an um, important reference point for so many people from so many different points of view as well. So that's why it is so controversial. Um, and I think, again, it's very difficult, and that's also in institutional studies what, what is very well established. Once an institution has been established, it gains a life of its own, and it's very difficult to, to do away with it. So, again, the, what one can think about is how to make it productive and representative um, and these kinds of things. So, and, and that's why I think... He says it can't be made, yeah. it's not yeah. representative. No, no, I, I but that would kind of be my ultimate aim to yeah. kind of contribute to that. I don't know if that will happen, but that would be an idea and that's why I think it's relevant. So no, I, think I, I actually, I agree with Sarah that it is relevant. But it is, but it is, you know, I mean, you look at it, its relevance differently and I look at its relevance 
differently. And I see it as a relevant institution which contributes to a certain conservative meta-narrative and it creates that and it helps create that and uh, it actually also enforces in, in some cases. And uh, for instance, I mean, there was a domestic violence bill, um, a, chi a child marriage bill or which, I mean, there, there are qu quite a lot of examples that, you know, child marriage, they, and they get stuck in, in the council. So, so you, you see, so it is, it has relevance in that, in that sense. Uh, but you know, when it is about regulating uh, society, uh, it is not relevant, but it is about influencing the parliament and the other legislators, it becomes relevant. Uh, so wherever there is a, a, a support, you know, that uh, the, some um, conservative parliamentarians would like to draw upon, it is the Council of Islamic Ideology that provides that support. So yeah, the institution is there. Um, but in terms of, as I said earlier, that, you know, for me personally, it may be a very radical view but there is no need for such an institution. Because again, as I said, and I'm just uh, at the cost of repeating myself, that the Article 227 of the Constitution, in fact, binds every legislator, whether Muslim or from any other uh, faith in pa or who's a Pakistani citizen, that they cannot make a law which is repugnant to the basic teachings of Islam. So, you know, in that sense. But, you know, it's an institutional. If you look at the book, I mean, it is from an institutional perspective also that how the institution has evolved and how the institution has actually become a part of our, you know, the, the ecosystem. Uh, but, you know, there has to be some people who would, who would continue to uh, argue that it is, an, it is not a relevant institution anymore. And I think there are, uh, it, is about, it, it is up to the parliament, ideally speaking, to decide whether they want to continue with certain institutions or not. I mean, there are many institutions which, uh, when the parliament decides to uh, make the National Commission for Human Rights dormant, it stays dormant. It's a statutory institution. It stays dormant for three years. Uh, and this is, uh, so I, th I think that can be, that can also be debated. I mean, there are institutions which actually um, have their life and then they are uh, sort of gotten rid of because their need is over. Quite so. So is, is there a need for the Pakistani state to maintain this institution, which um, actually consumes a fair amount of resources, but even more than that, it creates an ambiance which then drives towards greater religiosity, towards a greater distancing from modernity, and which then uh, creates fissures and fractures within the society itself. So certainly one could uh, agree with you, Harris, on this. But tell us a little bit, uh, Sarah, about uh, how, it, how about other countries? Take uh, Egypt, for example, Al-Hazar University, their issues, the weekly uh, khutbas, the, and it is that one khutbah which is then broadcast in all the masjids of um, Egypt, whereas here, every Malvi has his own take on, on everything. So this has, in fact, weakened the, the, the cohesiveness of Pakistani society. How has it worked out in Egypt? Are you, have you studied that or are you familiar with that? Perhaps we'd like to know. Um, to be honest, not that much. Um, I mean, I have looked also, for instance, at the Dianet a little bit in Turkey, the, so this Ministry of Religious Affairs in Turkey, um, and a little bit at the Guardian Council in Iran and the Majlis Shura in Saudi Arabia, um, and a little bit at Al Azhar as well. But I mean, what 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 I can say is, and there I'm coming back to governance uh, patterns that in certain countries like Turkey or also in Egypt, there's more of a centralized. Um, system um, because also the society like for instance in Turkey most of the Muslim population is Hanafi has like a certain uh, 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 school of thought and so on while Pakistan in that sense is very heterogeneous as well in terms of this different schools of thought and so on and so in Pakistan you always and that's why I was talking about this network um, is very disorganized <laughs> in a way but for me, it's it's not a failure, but it's actually part of the state uh, 
uh, governance patterns because when the, the, so in that sense the government can always go to a different in, if it doesn't agree with the council it will go to another institution and ask for their advice and so you can play out the different um, institutions against each, each other and Nida Kemani she worked on Karachi and so she calls this calculated opacity so it's it's basically it's never really clear you can go wherever you want when you don't like something you go to a different institutions so it's actually the decentralized is actually very much part of governance here, while in other countries, for instance Egypt, and you, there you also see this with the military regime there, which was there for a long time, was much more centralized. Um, and in that sense, Pakistan, I think, is very different. Um, and for me, to be honest, and that was this, the discussion on the Nizam-e Salat calendar in Islamabad, um, you can say, on the one hand, it's great if there's only one azan per sector, for instance. Um, but on the other hand, then, yeah, the question is, which one is it? And um, it can also create even more um, dissatisfaction. So on the other hand, you can also say, maybe it's plurality in a way as well. So the, th there's like this fine line, right? Like, how much do you need to standardize? Because in a way, then you're, again, trying to standardize. And we have these discussions about standard uh, uh, uniform curriculum and so on. And so that also creates problems. Um, and then on the other hand, there's also plurality. But I, I do uh, uh, see also completely that uh, it also creates so much violence, it creates so much strife. So here I think, yeah, the question is how much standardization and unity is necessary and how much plurality is also necessary. Um, and so it's kind of, B both is needed. Well, I think uh, people can have different views on that. Does it create unity or does it create disunity? And we saw that it didn't create sufficient unity for East Pakistan to stay East Pakistan. We also see that um, within cities, there is an increasing tendency for different maslaks, for different uh, sects, to now create their own housing societies. She has their Boris there in Karachi, Ismailis there, the Christians in some small corner. So it's led to a fractionation of society rather than create unity. And this is something that the ruling that the rulers of Pakistan have never understood, or if they've understood, it's a means of staying in power. Um, yeah, I mean, there's this. Uh, this is the same question with the Riyadh Hilal Committee, no? So you have, on the one hand, you have the standardization, and then, but you always have the the committee in Peshawar which disagrees because, and and so, and that's why for me, one of my arguments is also you can't detach religion from other concerns because I think, for instance, with the Riyadh Hilal Committee, it's not only about religion here; it's also people feeling unjustly treated in, for instance, in Peshawar as a province, for instance, as well, against the Punjabis. So it's not necessarily religion, but it's like KP against Punjab. So that also comes out there in a way. So, and, and that's why I think it cannot be isolated. We have to look at the grievances are maybe expressed through religion. And I think that's exactly when you read the Constituent Assembly debates, Shokat Hayat Khan, I quote him quite a lot, he said exactly that. He said, if we make this council, then um, why don't we trust our, what you said, what both of you said, why don't we trust our representatives to be good Muslims and to make decisions according to the principles of Islam? Why do we need this extra um, uh, uh, council for that? So uh, they kind of predicted that already. Um, but again, uh, I think it has to be seen in relation to notions of what is democratic, what is democratic governance, then uh, resource distribution and so on and so on. So for me, it's not, it's, it's actually part of all of that. It's not a single one. And I think very often also in academic literature and even in the discussions, it's and I, just about religion and it's about what are the intentions of people and so on. And then it's, it always comes down to they're dishonest about things. But I, I think, again, it's more integrated and it's more complicated than that. Um, yeah, it goes back to history. If you um, look at what A.K. Brohi used to say, he said that there is no poison greater than provincialism. And 
and Ziaul al Haq, who said it even more clearly, he said that you, if you take Islam away from Pakistan, it will collapse like a house of cards. So that fear exists in our ruling class. It's not a fear that I think should exist now, because Pakistan is a nation. It is a country now. It's a geographical entity. It's still not a nation. It'll, it could become one in time. But now there is sufficient self-interest for peoples to live together. But this is something that is not realized up there at the top. Again, going back to the example of ruyat e hilal Committee. Now, ruyat e hilal Committee will always be led by a Brailwee cleric. So it is another power center created uh, to regulate uh, moon sighting. And something really interesting is that it's all you know, within the Sunni domain of politics because there's never a question of when the, the Islamic New Year begins. So when the Muharram's moon is sighted, it is the same 10th of Muharram in Peshawar. It is the same 10th of Muharram Ashura in Lahore, the same in Karachi. But when it is the Shawal moon which is sighted, it is, you know, there's a difference. And it, there's an insistence. But I would, I would go with Masjid Qasim Jan because Masjid Qasim Jan actually predates the creation of this country. And it was a local institution. And all the, you know, the whole Peshawar Valley depended on the decision made by that institution. So why do we have to negate Masjid Qasim Jan and create another ruyat e hilal committee which sits on the top of uh, Habib Bank Plaza in Karachi or some other... Uh, wannabe skyscraper in Islamabad. And even Fawad Chaudhary could not defeat it. And even Fawad Chaudhary could not defeat it with all his, you know, to give the devil his due. Um, uh, I mean, that's a, a misal. Hai. Uh, so, uh, you know, I mean, that's, a, that's an uh, idiom. Idiomatically speaking. Uh, he's a friend. So, um, so basically, um, the, coming back to the, you know, the question of regulating. You see, uh, uh, Parvez, you know that you know, I don't have a particular uh, sort of an anti-British uh, bias as, as is enjoyed by some of our other friends. But I do see it as a problem of colonialism. This composition and expression of Islam in South Asia, of which Pakistan is a part, is actually a 19th century project. We did not have a Barelvi school of thought. We did not have the Ubandis. We had people who were Malais, who could be both Sunni and Shia, and at times would also be practicing some Hindu rituals. And you still have, I mean, if you look at the subaltern studies, and, I, and, and it's, it's actually very interesting that all these schools whether it is Ahmadiyya or whether it is Barelvi or whether it is uh, the Obandi or whether it is, uh, you know, the, the creation of uh, the Islamic, the new Islamic parties, uh, post-Congress. I mean, these are all Jamiyat Ulama Hinds, Jamiyat Ulama Islam, and there's uh, very specific standardized, you know, the, the, uh, um, the tendency to regulate and standardize is all late 19th, early 20th century. And this is something that we need to, to look at, that the whole you know, expression and composition of, of you know, how an Islamic state should look like is also a product of this brush with colonialism. And, and that you find in Egypt as well. And that you find in Saudi Arabia as well. I mean, Saudi Arabia uh, became the, was created as a center of Islam after uh, the end of the Ottoman Empire. And the 1920s, you look, the, the, the new Saudi family coming up and the way, you know, it was being sort of s standardized. And I was, you know, I, was, I, I had a meeting with this very interesting uh, linguist the other day in, 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 in Karachi, I believe. And he was telling me that, you know, the calendar that we follow, the lunar calendar that we follow, uh, is actually not the calendar that the Arab navi navigators followed when they are circumventing around the globe. And it was a solar calendar, and the calendar in, in, in the time of the Prophet, Holy Prophet, was actually a combination of a lunar and solar calendar. And that's why they had sometimes 13 months in a year, sometimes 11 months in a year, and sometimes 14 months in a year. So I think there are so many things about, uh, you know, this, the whole abstract notion of creating an Islamic state, which need to be revisited. Um, but I, I still think that... Um, uh, you know, there are, there are things which we need to look at, the sources we need to look at, 
before the arrival of the printing press, the different interpretations we had, we need to look at. Um, so standardization, again, is a very modern uh, concept. And we have actually borrowed uh, many categories of analyses from physical sciences and applied them on, on social studies, as I would like to call them. Uh, but the concept of Islamic State is a very uh, vague one. It has never been clarified in history. You had in the 11th century al mawardi no, 9th century al mawardi and, and then 11th century, you, you, you have uh, Al-Ghazali. Al-Ghazali also talks about this. Then no progress on this. No definite principles emerge. Then you have uh, Maulana Maududi, who actually, I think, has written the most definitive work on what an Islamic state should be. But then this is contested by others. And uh, today, even if uh, we have an Islamic state in, in Afghanistan, do we or do we not? I don't know. But it calls itself the Islamic Imarat. Well, Daesh doesn't recognize it. And they have a problem with Daesh over there. So that, that not just the discussion, but the fight can go on on that. So that will is that is something that will never stop in history we've uh, consumed one full hour a little more actually and i'm sure there are a lot of questions so um i will recognize who is to ask the question please ask the question only in the mic because uh, <laughs> otherwise people who are watching this live will not be able to understand what you're saying uh, my question is ma'am sara uh, Ma'am Sarah, how you look the, the 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 laws which they are making the Islamic Council is making on the interpretation uh, which they which they wrote by their own, and after that uh, writing that uh, writing that interpretation, uh, then they are getting help from that uh, those interpretation to make a law. So it's a such a thing that they are uh, make, um, you can say getting power by uh, ruling by their own. Uh, wish and the things. Yeah, thank you very much for that question. Um, can I just also add one thing because you keep saying Islamic State, but also Pakistan is an Islamic Republic, and I think that's a specific form of state. I just wanted, I just want to mention it because I think that's actually important. Um, because, and that's why I said modern institution because it also means it doesn't only have to look back, but it can look forward as well. And there is room for creation and innovation in that sense as well. I just wanted to add that, and I think it fits really well. Thank you for your question, because the council also does revise its own decision uh, recommendations. Um, why and how, I, I haven't really found out, to be honest, because again, the reports, just reading the reports is not in enough information. But And, and that again also shows that it, it, it changes over time. Um, and and also, of course, with members. So they have revised their own decisions, definitely. Um, and and I think the other, uh, I, I hope I understood you correctly. So yeah, they also basically um, send recommendations to the ministries and not, uh, and, and so in that sense, uh, their, their recommendations flow into uh, the formulation of laws and that's exactly where a lot of the power in that sense of the council comes from and we can't even see that because everyone only looks at the examination of laws but they're actually already in intervening in that sense in the formulation of laws which is very informal. I mean you can kind of deduce it somewhat from the reports of the council when they give recommendations but what exactly the ministries do with that that's a black box, at least f for me and in my research, and I don't think it will be really possible to trace all of this. So who reads this and how they in in incorporate this in which ministry is not really clear. And so that's also part of this informality, again, um, that is very difficult to grasp. And so that's why when we talk about impact, we know there is an impact, but what exactly the impact is, I think is very difficult to put your finger on because of the, this informality. Hi, my question is from Sarah. Thank you very much for the enlightened talk and um, tedious book you studied in that. But uh, let, can you, uh, one thing you, can, you could uh, explain, I, I think, 
that you had never didn't have the proper access to all of the documents, I think. Is it so? So it is, uh, in that regard, you clarified that. My question is regarding the, uh, for the last 61 years, from the, uh, it came into being, the council, which era it was on high peaks, very effective, very influential. It was, uh, uh, um, got quite influential in making laws or whatever. And then got dropped and then got up. Just highlights. Thank you. Um, regarding, uh, so, so what I mean is basically, I think no one can get access to the debates of the council. So we only ever get the decisions. The the, yeah, the the, we only get the decisions, we don't get the minutes. Um, so I don't know, maybe maybe it's possible for someone to ever get access to them, um, but I, I, I haven't heard of that so far. <laughs> it's actually a decision that the Bhutto government took, um, I was told by a historian, that beforehand the debates were more, uh, like minutes were also more accessible, but then during Bhutto's uh, government, um, he declared that only, or like his government declared that only decisions are recorded. Um, uh, the second question uh, regarding yeah, high and low tidings um, uh, is also really interesting. So I think it depends on various factors. So on the one hand, it depends on the government and it depends on the chairperson. Um, so, for instance, interestingly enough, because uh, you said you noticed the council for the first time during the 1980s in the Ziel Hak era, so that's where the council was in the first half of the 80s and late, late 70s and early 80s was very active, but also the only time that the council was idle for two years was also during the Ziel Hak era. So, and I... The, the explanations I received, I don't know if it's true, is because also some of the decisions of the council, Zia ul -Haq didn't like them. So he actually didn't, after the council tenure was over, he didn't notify a new council for two years, between 1984 and 86. So it actually lay dormant. But beforehand, it was very active, um, and actively enough also under the chairmanship of judges. It was yeah. under Dr. Tanzilo Rehman, Justice Dr. Tanzilo Rehman. It was very, very, very active, and he initiated this Islamization of law. These reports, they were like I think ten or something. They published in in five years or so. So here you you see a peak. You see another peak um, in the 1990s during uh, Dr. S. M. Zaman's uh, tenure. He used to be also the uh, VC of Alama Iqbal Open University, um, but he actually took on a lot of questions from people, so he is the Sarat, so he actually was more, he wanted to be closer to the people, so there the council was also really active because they really looked at newspaper reports and took things from the newspaper and took Su Suomoto ac uh, action. And then under the chairmanship of Dr. Khalid Masood, the council decided we are overwhelmed. If we always look at the newspaper and the government, we don't do this anymore. So they decided different priorities. So there uh, you, you can see that it is changing, but it depends on different factors. Can you say something about the time of Dr. Fazlur Rahman? Um, so this was the 1960s, and I mean, this was also very interesting because um, in the 1960s, the council didn't have a research cell yet. So the council was dependent for its research on the Islamic Research Institute, which was founded in 1960. <coughs> and Dr. Fazlur Rahman was the, the head of the Islamic Research Institute, and he was also a member of the Council of Islamic Ideology. So. What was here interesting is also that the Islamic Research Institute was an independent organization which was not in the uh, relationship of dependency to the chairman. And so they furnished research. Um, and then later on, what happened is the council developed its research cell and all the researchers of the council are in a relationship of dependency to the chairman. So under, uh, in the 1960s, the council actually had to listen to the Islamic Research Institute. After 1973, the, uh, the council no longer had to listen to the Islamic Research Institute, so another checks and balances was kind of eliminated. And uh, coming back to Dr. Fazal Rahman, he was one of those, especially in the Riba <coughs> case, who was always writing notes of dissent. And they were actually um, accepted also 
um, and they were always added to the reports. And at some point, there are no more notes of dissents starting in the 1980s. So then the council only takes unanimous decisions. So also here, when we talk about pluralism and everything, in the 60s, it was okay for one or two members to dissent and to write notes. Well, this was later on no longer acceptable, also because ministries said, we don't want dissent, we want one decision from you, we don't want several, we don't want options, we want one. Um, and so what happened was that he was always descending on a lot of, the, or critiquing a lot of decisions also of the council, and there were lots of his notes in all of the reports. And what they did is they kind of always inched closer to some decisions, but then when he was when he left in 1969, immediately afterwards the council took a unanimous decision on it. So also there sometimes the council, when there's one member who's not, um, who's a bit like uh, putting more, pro like uh, raising more problems, what is done is they just wait until that member leaves and then they take a decision. So um, that also happened. Thank you. Uh, I'm Navid Shinwari. Uh, so what I understood from your uh, you know, talk uh, about your, uh, the focus of your uh, PhD uh, dissertation is uh, understanding the governance in Isla of Islam under the Council of Islamic Ideology, its history and how it functions, uh, and other elements. Uh, uh, so maybe it's not about the history of Islam, but uh, the recent history of, of the Council of uh, Islamic Ideology. And maybe not uh, about uh, uh, how the moon sighting is done and who is doing this, so not about that. But I will also come back to uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Harris, uh, uh, whether the, uh, the institution has uh, relevancy or not. So I would like to ask uh, whether uh, you have critically examined the, the impact of this institution, positive or negative, and there we can find out whether it is still relevant or it should be, uh, you know, dismantled or whatever. So it's a comment as a question and a question as well. Thank you. Very much. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah, I, I have to say um, impact is very difficult to measure. Um, and so what I concentrated on here is, first of all, to understand how the institution works, because for me, one, the first step to also changing something is to actually understand what is going on and who the people are and so on. Um, and uh, uh, like I said, the impact of the council on, on policy making and law is very difficult to show because of this informality. So it would probably be necessary for someone to be like for one or two years to be in one ministry and to trace all of these communications. So um, that is something I think that it's very difficult to do. Um, in terms of uh, people, uh, no, I didn't do like an at attitude survey or something where I asked people about that. Um, one reason, again, was because for me it was, no one was really clear about what it is. So for me, that was my first step, was kind of to look at what is the council in the first place. Um, so no, in that sense, I, I, I didn't do that. And I think it would be a next step to uh, then maybe do. So my question is for both uh, Sir Praveen Sab and Haris Sab, especially. Uh, talking about the relevancy of this institution, uh, I would like to add that, yes, you are correct, that there is not a single word mentioned in the Quran about is it the establishing a state. But there are certain set of rules that uh, the God Almighty has said that if you have govern government in your hand, then you have to establish and you have to enforce these certain laws. And when you go into the applications of these laws, uh, there, uh, there are some, uh, I mean, uh, issues regarding that. That uh, on the applic uh, on the when you apply those uh, is uh, laws. So my question is: uh, Is uh, other uh, parliamentarians are qualified well enough to understand the dynamic nature of Islam and to relate it uh, to uh, with the modern issues, or there is a certain uh, need of this kind of institution which can be which can be you know say uh, uh, done uh, uh, I mean which can be modernized as well but it the relevance is there you cannot neglect it 
uh, altogether that it is not relevant because uh, God Almighty has uh, uh, revealed that some set of laws must be uh, uh, implemented in the state. Thank you very much. I think it is an important question because this is a, this is a view held by many people. But I have a very different view on, the, uh, on what you have said that there are certain rules or certain laws rather. You use the word laws. You see laws fall under jurisprudence. Speaking in, 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 in the same sort of uh, uh, language. And jurisprud the first jurisprudence was written after 100 years of the Holy Prophet. That was Imam Jafar Sadiq. If, if, I may, if you allow me to finish, then you can always uh, correct me. And, and, the, and then we have five, four, four majority Sunni jurisprudences and one uh, Fiqh-e Jafriya, which was the earliest, followed by Hanafi and Hanbali and Maliki and uh, Shafi. After that, you know, you have jurisprudences which are practiced by different, uh, uh, you know, other denominations. I mean, there are so many Muslim sects. In Pakistan, we have some, but if you look at the whole Middle East and North Africa, we'll find many, and also Far East. Uh, what I would say is that there are certain values that are taught to people who belong to any faith. And those values have to be interpreted and reinterpreted by the shuras, the parliaments. And that is my view on that. So the value is that you speak, uh, whatever you speak has to be the, you know, the truth, you have to be honest, you have to be just, and those values have to be translated into laws by legislators in different Muslim societies. I have a different view on, on state having a religion. Uh, you may have a different view, but that's, uh, uh, that's what I, uh, you know, how, how I see it. Thank you. Actually, there is no way that one can keep laws that originated in the 7th century and transport them into the 21st century because one would run into fundamental problems. Take the issue of slavery. Slavery is not prohibited in Islam, and yet the Pakistani state, which, is, which calls itself an Islamic republic or a state, expressly forbids slavery. Now, here's a big problem because no law can be made in violation of uh, the Islamic laws. But Islamic law does not prohibit slavery. In fact, we know that slavery existed in Islam until the 18th century when under the Ottomans it was finally outlawed. Or to give you another example, anachronism that is to say, photography, painting, that was forbidden and is forbidden. Nothing has changed in either the Quran or the Hadith. And yet, what you see is open, flagrant violation of that. You have television, you have cameras, you have Malvis taking selfies of themselves. <coughs> Remember that 30 years ago, it wasn't this way. 30 years ago, when that earthquake came in 2005, uh, sorry, sorry, I got my, my, my arithmetic wrong. 20 years, or less than 20 years ago, that, that the earthquake was being blamed on television. That people, because they were watching television, was the reason why the Azabi Lahi visited Pakistan and killed 90,000 people. Now, we simply cannot keep those laws from the 7th century because otherwise <laughs> we uh, will have to strip away everything that we have in our world today. Therefore, as uh, Harris said, concentrate only upon that which is good, which is humane, which is progressive, and call it Islam, that's fine. That's, there's no problem with that. Say there is only one God and he's the last prophet and all that, that's, that's perfectly fine. But any attempt to take those laws and implement today is 101% is a guarantee of internal strife of society then falling apart. There is no such thing as an Islamic state and there never will be an Islamic state because ne not, it has never existed in history, never.
I, I also just wanted to add one thing. Um, so in the Constitution, it doesn't say Islamic law. It says law, laws should be repugnant to the principles of Islam. It doesn't say Islamic law. It doesn't say Sharia. It says Islamic principles. I think that's a, a difference. And I also think this obsession with law is a very modern thing. So no one, so this is also from the 1980s onwards. Um, so why don't we talk about welfare? Isn't welfare maslaha? Isn't that also part of it? So it's also like there were certain frames that we can't get out of in a way. And I think again, that's part of it. Why don't we talk about, like, like you said, land reforms or the common good and everything. Why isn't that what we talk about? Um, and, and instead of talking about punishments and, and uh, I don't know, domestic, like, okay, domestic violence is important, but like on the, the headscarf, for instance, yeah, why is that such an important topic instead of, again, talking about um, the other is issues as well? So here, again, it's Im embedded in global power structures. Um, and, and I think everyone has to recognize that. So this obsession always with law is a very modern thing. It's not... If, if you look back in time, it's not necessarily tradition. Sir, my question is for Mr. Harif. Oh, sorry, Haris. Sir, uh, the people of Pakistan are too much attached with the religion. Uh, they are s sentimental. They follow it or not that the other debate, but they, uh, they can be manipulated in any way. So suppose this council is ended. So the, uh, don't you think the more resistance will come from the people by themselves? Uh, Yes, sir. this is my question. I, I don't know, really. I mean, I can, I can only say that there are certain institutions which are not needed because they are neither doing ijma, nor qayas, nor ishtahad. It's a very political decisions that they make. Even I'm, I'm just speaking the language that they use, but they're not using the, you know, what was, what was done earlier in Islamic history or, or Muslim history, rather. Um, People will take to the streets, belonging to those political factions and parties who have a share, who have a stake in the Islamic Council of Islamic Ideology. But that does not mean that uh, everybody will, not, will, will be unhappy. Because as I said earlier, that the majority is not represented. But it can always turn into a political issue and emotions can be whipped up. Uh, but that does not mean that we do not take a principled position or I do not convey my opinion to you that there are many other institutions. It's just not just one. For, ex for example, the ruyat -e hilal Committee, as I mentioned. Uh, there are so many things which should be left to the community, which should be left to the, the society to decide, to a neighborhood to decide. I mean, why are we regulating uh, uh, Dara Adam Khel or, or Khaybar Agency from Karachi or Rawalpindi? where the ruyat -e hilal Committee sits. I mean, there's no point. There's no, there's no reason for doing that. It was never the case. Because as, as Parvez was saying, or, or you know, that uh, how, how, how do we know that there, when there was Eid in uh, uh, Madina to Nabi, the same day the Eid was celebrated in, in Kufa, or the same day the Eid was celebrated in Damascus. We don't know that. So, because there was no possibility of, of, a, of a, you know, of exchange of information or such kind of communication links that we enjoy today. So I think that is something that we need to understand. People are attached to religion. Yes, people should be attached to religion if they want so. But that's about their you know, personal conduct, their personal life, and their community. Uh, but you know, my contention is, uh, humbly put, that if a state, which is an abstract concept in itself, uh, declares itself to have a faith, it will definitely have a sect and a subsect. Because that's how power works because it becomes a political issue rather than the issue of faith and religion. Um, my question is from Madam Sara. There, do you find any case or example that uh, Islamic ideology change uh, or influence decision maker or policy makers to change any uh, law or any kind of, uh, uh, what we say, uh, decision? Do you find it in your study? Uh, so I, uh, I haven't, of course, because they made so many decisions. So of course, I didn't look at everything. Um, uh, that that wouldn't have been possible. Um, but I mean, uh, what you can, uh, and, and I think that's a general pattern. What you can see is that there's um, one decision on on a certain question, and then 
uh, this is a similar in the federal Sharia court and with the Sharia appellate bench. And then there's a small question by a ministry, and it's referred back to the council for clarification. Um, like, what is the amount uh, of this, or what what are what are the categories involved in this, and so on? So here, um, uh, in in that sense, I I think it has influenced uh, definitely. Um, in one case, for instance, with uh, organ transplantation, that would be a very recent example um, because the Council of Islamic Ideology already looked at the permissibility of our organ transplantation in the 1990s, roughly. And I don't, it's, I, I think I have it somewhere in the book, I don't know the exact timeline, but in the past, I don't know, 2013 <laughs> or something, the government of Pakistan actually t made a law ag about organ transplantation. So actually the opinion of the council was the reference point because it already existed. So there, the, that was the baseline kind of, and, and it set the frame. Um, so that, that is, for instance, one uh, example, yeah, a recent one. Uh, Ms. Sarah, I have uh, three questions. Uh, so one by one, uh, uh, first of all, uh, as long as uh, the non-Muslims, uh, as long as uh, the non-Muslims are the citizens of Pakistan, so do you believe that uh, there should be uh, such councils for non-Muslims minorities representation? Number one, and question number two is: uh, Do you believe that the Council of Islamic Ideology also protects the minority rights? Uh, uh, normally, we see that uh, always they. Uh, uh, they establish some kind of uh, 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 rulings and decisions and recommendations that are against uh, or, or in the favor of Muslims only. <clears throat> the third question is uh, in context, uh, as the, uh, Mr. Hoodboy also mentioned, uh, in context of Islamic world globally. So do you think that uh, the suitable title uh, for Islamic ideology could be uh, ideological Council of Pakistani Islam. So I, I think these minorities councils, I think it really also depends on the structure because for instance, Christians is mostly organized in churches. So you already have a hierarchy there. Like with with Catholics, there is the Pope already who sits in Rome. So the, the organization of Christianity is very different to Muslims. So in that sense, I think that's a... Uh, I, I, do, I don't know if there should be or could be such a council, but I think that so here you also have to think about or Hinduism, for instance, as well. It's so diverse and there are so many different schools as well, but I think when they are a minority in a majority country, it's less about factionalism and it's more about representing the whole religion, so to speak. So if, you, if we take the example of Germany, for instance, we have... Uh, the an, an, a council for uh, of Muslims and so and they are like Alevis in there they're Shia they're, and they're actually the sect as such is not important but it's actually more nationality based so you have uh, a, a Turkish uh, like uh, majority you have like Iranians and so on so that is again very different so I think um, I, I, I can't really give you there an answer, so it, it always depends on minority-majority context and w what the religion then also is and how it's organized. Um, the second uh, part, uh, uh, does it protect minority rights? I, I don't know, yes and no, because I think some of the decisions also can uh, negatively impact minorities, but the council does invite also um, dignitaries from other religions to its sessions and so on, so they try to accommodate them somehow as well. So um, inadvertently, but I think though some of the polarization that uh, can then affect, of course, minorities as well. So I think probably both in some ways. Um, Pakistan Islam, I don't know. I think that's actually the major contention as well, right? Because um, uh, uh, then you could basically, and I think the Majlis Ishuda in Saudi Arabia, they invite foreigners as members. Yeah. So actually it's not expressively prohibited in Pakistan. It says Muslim. It doesn't say Pakistani Muslims. So technically the president could maybe uh, also appoint a Muslim from another country to the council. It doesn't say it's a Pakistani citizen. So, um, and, and I think that's the major question, right, of that. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, someone of you have has said that uh, the council uh, the council had declared that uh, the riba is haram but 
uh, but what actually riba is uh, members have different views my question is has ever the council uh, has ever the council members go against their fundamental sectarian belief and made a uh, unanimous uh, uh, and uh, second question is um, do this council teach uh, teach for it for eternity among the uh, different sects um, thank you. So the first question is, has it taken a unanimous decision on RIPA? Um, so I think an interesting case is probably an, uh, the Zakat and Asha ordinance in 1980. So actually there, I, again, I don't know all the background information because I can only look at decisions of the council. But um, uh, when Zia ul Haq prom uh, promulgated the Zakat and Asha ordinance and then there were a lot of Shia who protested against it, right? Because they didn't want the state to connect the Zakat. So there the council, actually a lot of members, and they were all Sunni members, they all stepped down from the council, they resigned. And this was the highest number of resignations in the council in its entire history. So there something happened. I don't know what happened, but there was definitely something going on um, and uh, be between the council members and maybe also the government and the council. I can't exactly say what, but there was something that would need follow-up. Um, so I, I don't exactly It was know. about Zakat, actually. It, it right? was, but yeah. I don't know what, yeah. what exactly yeah. the disagreement was, but I'm, it seems there was some sectarian issues and against certain <coughs> fundamental beliefs. But what exactly, I can't tell you because I don't have access to the documents. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. Yes, hello. Thank you very much for the presentation. I have just one question, uh, one question about um, how the, the decisions are made in the council. Is it like a majority decision that goes as advice to the government and um, the setup of the, of the, the members? But all the Islamic sects, I think, are represented, but the, the majority are they from Deobandi? You said something about Deobandi. And are the decisions and the... Dissenting notes, because you're also allowed to give your dissenting note, right, to the to the government. Have you looked into um, that? Or? Yeah. So um, the dissenting notes were only in the 1960s and 70s, then they stopped. So um, so there you can see that the the, the ministries pushed the council to take unanimous decision or not unanimous but majority decisions. So the council usually says. Mutafiko, so it's in agreement. Mutafik, yeah. So it doesn't it doesn't say unanimous most of the time. Okay. It just says they're in agreement. Um, what I have seen from my own observations is that there are also some council members who don't come to the council, and they are mostly the ones to the council sessions who are not happy with what is happening. So there's definitely there there, there is an imp like act, uh, to. Out to the outside, they appear unanimous, but within the council, there are definitely strives. And I do, well, from the observations I have seen, yes, the, the specifically those who are from minority groups, they they a lot of them do feel kind of um, overlooked in a way, okay. um, and that also depends again on how the notes are prepared. Um, and then you had one other, uh, oh yeah, about, so up until, interestingly enough, up until the 1980s, there were no Deobandi, uh, no, up until 1973, there were no Deobandis in the council. It was only Barelvi, um, Jamati Islami, I think one or two, and then it was like judges and um, educationists, actually. And then from the 70s onwards, there are hardly any educationists, like Alama, basically, and or people who are <coughs> vice chancellors and you see more and more ulema. Um, and what you see, for instance, then in the late 80s, you have the first member from Balochistan, and then only now with Alama um, uh, uh, Shahidi from the MWM, he's the first one from Gilgit, for instance, only in the 2010s who's appointed. So suddenly you also pro provincial uh, alignments also make an appearance in the council. So you can see whenever a a certain religious party or organization becomes uh, more established, then also someone from that group is appointed to the council. So you can, by observing council memberships, you can see the waxing and waning, so to speak, of different groups. Yeah. Also. Maybe someday they will invite Maulana Hidayatur Rahman. <laughs> Thank you very much for being here. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Harris.
It's been a great discussion. There are lots of other questions. I know, I know there are questions all over, but we've run out of time. So do excuse us. And thank you again for being here.